Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for attending tonight. Uh, we're um, excited to have our palliative care team um, and as part of Smilo Shares with uh, Primary Care. Um, this is a series that Karen Brown uh, and I really have developed uh, and lots of people have helped with uh, to really focus on um, the perspective of, of of cancer and and palliative care, well, cancer and cancer and pal palliative care services for um, patients. Uh, and let's see, let's uh, start with the slides, please. And just so you folks know, um, if you ever, if you or other people want to access these afterwards, there's a YouTube link. Uh, and actually, we've been having lots of folks access those uh, earlier or earlier lectures that we've had. So next slide, please. Um, as many of you may know, this is a monthly lecture series that focuses on primary care perspectives on cancer and, and hematology. Um, we love having our faculty panel with featuring, featuring primary care and our SMILO uh, and other experts. Um, and we try for Tuesdays, the first Tuesday of the month, five to six. Uh, again, you can access these afterwards. Um, and while there are lots of different venues that can teach you about cancer topics, this is really a case-based discussion that highlights um, uh, key, key understandings and advances um, from the primary care perspective. Um, Next slide. Uh, we are gonna do some introductions and then we'll jump into our cases. We have some great ones today. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm gonna introduce, oh, I'm a medical oncologist. I'm gonna introduce Dr. or Karen Brown is gonna introduce herself and then, and then start out with our introductions. Thanks. Karen. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And um, thank you to everyone joining um, as well as to the panelists. Um, who have prepared a really uh, terrific session. In, in primary care, uh, one of our greatest challenges is caring for patients with cancer. Um, and the most challenging parts of that are when they first present and we need to make a diagnosis. And at the end, um, in the middle, there's a lot of heavy oncologic care and they kind of know where they're going. So I'm especially looking forward uh, to learning more today about how we can help them at the, the end um, of their cancer journey or as they get more advanced in their cancer journey. Um, I want to introduce uh, my uh, Northeast Medical Group colleague, Dr. Ola Rosinski. Um, she received her undergraduate degree in physiology and neurobiology at UConn. She then went on to medical school at Jagiellonian. Did I get it right? Uh, University Medical College in Poland, and she completed her residency in internal medicine at St. Vincent's Medical Center here in Bridgeport. She was in um, academic medicine and was the assistant and then associate program director for internal medicine at St. Vincent's. And she was also the ambulatory education coordinator and worked on developing the ambulatory resident curriculum. We were fortunate that she joined Northeast Medical Group in 2019. She sees patients full-time in New Haven and also teaches students in her office. Uh, she is well regarded by her patients and um, our medical community. And in her spare time, she likes to bake and she's a history buff with a special interest in the ancient Near East. I'll pass it along to you, Anne, for your introductions. Am I on now? Mm -hmm. that's, that's helpful. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Morgan Bain. He's currently the section head for palliative care at Greenwich Hospital and former professor of me medicine at Duke. Um, he studied undergraduate at Wesleyan and got his med school degree at VCU um, and trained at Norwalk Hospital in Connecticut in affiliation with Yale followed by a geriatric medicine fellowship at, the, at Mount Sinai in New York City. Um, he's board certified in internal medicine, hospice and palliative medicine and geriatric medicine. And he has many years experience of experience caring for vulnerable adults with lots of complex medical needs. Um, 
His passions are patient care and medical education, uh, and having taught hundreds of medical students, house staff, and, and physicians throughout his career. Uh, next, I have Dr. Kristen Edwards. Uh, she's a, a board certified physician in internal medicine, hospice, and palliative medicine. She's the medical director of palliative care at Bridgeport Hospital. She manages all aspects of the pal care program there, including clinical care, education, management. She's the site director for the uh, Yale Geriatrics Hospice and pa Palliative Medis Medicine Fellowship. Um, she's an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Yale. And in 2019, she was actually awarded Emerging Leader in Hospice and Palliative Medicine, uh, a national award given every five years to 40 leaders in the field of palliative care. So fantastic work, Kristen. Um, and then finally, Dr. Liz Perzich. She's a physician specializing in medical oncology and palliative care. She received her medical degree from George Washington uh, University School of Medicine and did her residency and fellowship at Brown. Um, she is uh, certified also in, or sorry, she had her fellowship also at Brown focusing on end of life and palliative care. So she's double fellowship, medonc, and uh, palliative care. She's an assistant professor at Yale. She's the director of adult inpatient palliative care at Yale New Haven Hospital uh, and firm chief for, for the medical oncology unit at Smile Cancer Hospital. And she's dedicated to serving patients with ser serious life or life-limiting illness with complex medical needs, um, difficult to control symptoms and supporting their caregivers. This is a, just a terrific team of folks I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, and so really, really excited about the panel tonight. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Rosinski to, to start off. Good evening, everyone. So let's get started. Case one is an 82-year-old female comes to the office for an urgent visit regarding a lump in her left breast that she noted yesterday. Her last screening mammogram was 15 years ago. She doesn't have any pain, although it does feel tender when she presses on it. She has no redness, skin changes, nipple discharge, or weight loss. The exam is notable for a mass in the left breast, two by four centimeters in the 11 o'clock position, 10 centimeters from the nipple. The mass is firm with no tenderness of the mass itself, but there is tenderness of the surrounding tissue. There is left axillary lymphadenopathy present. Diagnostic mammogram and ultrasound were ordered. The patient herself is very afraid that this is cancer and that she will die. She says that she's not ready. So you order the mammogram and there is a 3.2 centimeter irregular mass with an indistinct margin in the left breast at the 12 o'clock middle depth. And um, the biopsy shows invasive ductal carcinoma, poorly differentiated. The patient would like to pursue curative treatment. So how would you structure your conversation with this patient? And would you even mention palliative care at this point? And to help us answer those questions, I'd like to turn over to my colleague, Dr. Edwards. Okay, thank you. Um, so a couple of things, I think, let me, just, can everybody hear me okay? Um, on this patient, you know, really we're still trying to find out what is her prognosis at this point. I'm sure she's overwhelmed with emotions um, and really just trying to figure out what next steps are. So I think the conversation would really be a lot of listening. Um, and and I bef we're gonna get to some of those communication pearls in my second slide. Um, it, I'm gonna tackle the first question, the second question first then, which is what I mentioned palliative care. I probably wouldn't mention palliative care in this particular inter interaction because again, it's very early and still trying to figure out what exactly is going on. And part of that is because of what the definition of palliative care is. So if you can go to the next slide. 
So there are a couple of models out there for palliative care that are helpful to understand. Um, palliative care used to be thought of as very sequential. So um, the top model is what's called an integrated model, which was the new and improved way of thinking of palliative care about 10 to 15 years ago. Um, before that, we thought of it really as all of these therapies to prolong life, then almost a flip the switch, and then there was hospice, which was approximately the last six months, and bereavement care afterwards. And that was when the hospice benefit was introduced in the 1970s. Up, the integrated model recognizes that palliative care includes the end of life portion, but also includes all of these therapies that are geared at relieving suffering or improving quality of life along the way. Palliative care, it, the other part of that's really important to understand is that there's primary palliative care and specialty level palliative care. And so everyone who's on this call already does some primary palliative care. Um, that is the, the basic, how do you deliver bad news? How do you have a serious conversation? Um, how, what symptoms are you controlling? And so whether or not you refer this patient to specialty level palliative care initially, I'm not sure that I would introduce it in this particular conversation. If it came up, I certainly would, um, but and I would have that explanation that palliative care is an extra layer of support, but I wouldn't necessarily introduce it as the first thing on my mind. The second model that I think is important to understand is this other model, which is the bow tie model. This one came out in about 2014, um, and it's one of my favorite models because it shows, it's the same diagram, but it shows how they overlap and whether you look at it from a disease management perspective or a palliative care perspective, you see that palliative care is much more than just hospice. So in fact, palliative care can be done even when patients are expected to get better. Um, this, this talk is obviously focused about patients with oncology, but we do palliative care in all settings. So we do palliative care for other disease, uh, ser serious illnesses, and even including trauma, burn, et cetera, in which patients are definitely expected to get better. So it's someone who has a serious illness, but not necessarily terminal illness and needs additional symptom management, communication, um, and uh, goals of care or decision-making along that process. Can we go to the, my next slide? Oh, oh, sorry. Let me go back. Um, let me go back to that one. The, the communication phrases, I'm going to, I think what I would focus on for this particular patient would be setting the stage for her to focus on specifically next steps. So um, one would be addressing the emotions and empathy and then helping her focus on truly what are the next steps that she wants to know about and how would she focus specifically on just the next steps for the moment. I think my communication pearls will come in after the next part of this case. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that then. Okay. So we're going to continue the case. The patient um, afterwards underwent lumpectomy with lymph node dissection. She had 12 of 14 sentinel nodes positive for metastatic disease. About four months later, the patient really begins to decline. Uh, the workup at that time included a PET CT that showed avid mediastinal bilateral hilar and left internal mammary lymph nodes that were highly suspicious for met met uh, metastasis, avid multifocal liver and osseous metastasis, lytic metastasis involving the right occipital condyle. Her daughters at this point are with her in the appointment, and I've heard that even with METs, some patients can be cured. Her declining functional status is noted. She has, by this point, been spending more than half her time in bed during the day. So the question that we have is, how do you transition her goals of, her goals of care at this juncture? And I think Dr. Edwards is going to talk a little bit more about that. So if we could go to, yeah. So, so this is the slide that I'll walk through some of the communication tools. And um, some of these would have been appropriate even in the first conversation that I had with this patient. So that's really important to recognize. You may have seen some of these tools already. They're, while we do think of them as palliative care tools, they're really just communication tools. And some of them you will have seen in other forms that do communication. So whether it's leadership training or education or uh, patient-centered relation uh, communication, you may have seen similar phrases uh, that are used. So I'm gonna go through each one of these. Some of these are um, what I, the I wish statements. I'm sorry, the, the slide I think got um, changed. So the first one is actually supposed to read ask, tell, ask. Um, and then the second one is I wish statement. So bear with me. It's not important for the slide, but it does, it does matter in terms of the, the terms. So ask, tell, ask is a way we think of structuring the conversation. So actually, if you go back to that first conversation with the patient, 
what you, when you ask, you ask what they know and what they want to know. You wait for their answers. And then what, based on what they say, then you tell them what they've asked and what the clinical update is. And then you ask again, what have they heard? So that you make sure that you have explained it well, what questions do they have and what else do they want to know? And the reason to do it in this structure is it really helps pace the conversation for what somebody can absorb, especially when they're overwhelmed with emotion in a first encounter. So if you think about that very first encounter when you met her, to help her focus on those next steps, I would have used an ask, tell, ask strategy to get through that conversation. The other comments, um, tell me more, is a good one to use when you're not sure what someone is saying or, or what you're, they're said something, but you wanna explore a little bit more what's behind the statement or the question. So simply tell me more. And then the, the next one that should be an I wish statement um, or an I worry, so it's two things, I wish and then I worry. We use I wish statements there to say um, when someone is expressing something that you don't think is realistically possible. So an example would be, I wish that we were going to be able to cure this cancer with more chemotherapy. And I'm worried that that may not be possible given your functional status. So when you combine them that way, it does two things. One is it, it reinforces the reality of what's there. It also, with the I wish, it aligns you with that person. And so it really is empathy building and relationship building. The I worry part of it allows you to introduce some of the concerns that might come up. It'll like, again, allows you to empathize and to align yourself with that person. And it allows you to introduce a little bit of the humanity of you as the clinician interacting with that patient as well. The next one here is we're in a different place. This comes from Vital Talk training. I know Liz will certainly um, recognize that one. And that's for this patient in particular, she may have wanted curative intent. You may have had suspicions that that might not have been possible in the first time, but it wasn't entirely clear. But then to say, I know we started chemotherapy or I know we wanted chemotherapy. We're in a different place now than when we first met. Let's talk about how we can still meet your goals here. It's a way to signpost that we're gonna be transitioning to a different plan than we had before. In terms of exploring goals, so when you do signpost, then we're, we can transition. So what are you hoping for? Now that you've gone through some of that, here's where we are, this is what's realistic. Um, I like to ask, what are you hoping for? It gives an understanding of what their values are. If time were short, um, I use were in this case because sometimes well, actually almost always planning for the future and putting some distance between you and the future is actually much easier for patients to, to do. So if, if you were to get sicker, can we talk about what you would want? Um, it's often psychologically easier to discuss than if you do get sicker or when you get sicker. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a nuance there. And then the comment of what else are you hoping for can be useful in terms of when somebody says, well, I'm hoping to get better. Well, I, I'm hoping for that too. And I'm worried if that doesn't happen, is there something else that you're hoping for that we can aim for? Again, it just softly redirects them to something that might be able to be achieved rather than perhaps something that's not realistic for them. One of the other key things that we use is silence, obviously, um, to allow people to express their emotions, gather their thoughts, most people on the giving end of information, so clinicians feel much more uncomfortable with the silence than the person on the receiving end. They're just trying to get their heads um, around whatever news has been delivered. And so if you wait, they will usually offer what they need to say next. And then finally, if it goes on and on, you can certainly ask, can you tell me what you're thinking? And that will prompt them to, to discuss what's on their mind. Lastly, there is a, um, a mnemonic to help uh, reinforce those emp empathic statements. So nurse emotions, which is stands for you name the emotion. It's, it sounds like you're very frustrated or it sounds like you're very sad. Um, understand, can you tell me a little bit more about what's helping, what's making you feel sad right now? I respect, so respect is, I we respect the journey, respect that personhood. Um, I can understand how you might feel sad in the circumstances. I would certainly feel sad too. The support piece is really important for aligning yourself with that person for the duration of their care. I am gonna be here and walk you through every step. And then lastly is explore, what else is making you sad or what would support you? So, so that's a, just a little snippet of how to address emotions in an encounter.
Lastly, I just wanted to leave some tools that we have within our system. So um, uh, within EPIC itself, there are two places where you can find some advanced care planning pathway tools that can help guide these conversations. So one is the advanced care planning pathway. Unfortunately, it is only for inpatient right now, but it does exist. And then the other is advanced care planning tools where it is a serious illness guide conversation. It is literally, you can, you can print it out. And while that sounds, um, scripted. If you say, you know, I'm just going to keep these questions here because I want to make sure I cover the important things for you. Many times that is actually very well received by patients and families. And then lastly, if you um, additional training on how to have some of these conversations would be through CAPC, Vital Talk, and then the Serious Illness Conversation, which is the last one there. So I think for this individual, going back to the case, can we flip back one more slide backwards? Um, so the, how would I transition her from goals of care from cure to treatment would really be that conversation. What's important to you? I do see your, your functional status is declining. I'm worried that we're not gonna be able to get more chemotherapy uh, at this time. What would be important to you? And then I would go from there. I'm gonna pass on to Nick. Okay. So now we're on case two. So case two is a 47-year-old female with a GIST tumor metastatic to the liver, treated with uh, sutinib, it seeks advice for fatigue, abdominal pain, sores in the mouth, nausea, and insomnia. Her dose was actually recently increased and she does not think this is going well. Her GIST tumor was first diagnosed five years ago. At that time, she underwent surgery with splenectomy Initially, she was treated with imatinib and then transitioned to uh, sunitinib 50 milligrams due to recurrence. She's having the abdominal pain every day and she wants to avoid opiate medications. She has nausea daily, she has trouble eating and has lost about 10 pounds so far. She has a sore in her mouth, which is bothering her greatly and also prevents her from eating. Overall, she's feeling stressed, tired, and she can't sleep. So the questions are, how can palliative care help us manage her symptoms? How does prognosis factor into this discussion? Remember, she does have metastatic disease to the liver. And what is the role of primary care um, here? Now, she's been stable for a long time, even with the metastatic disease. So I'd like to um, go to my uh, colleague and. Thank you, Dr. Brzezinski. Actually, you can go back to the previous slide and we can tackle some of these questions. So, so this is an example of a patient who is, is not in the beginning of her cancer journey. She's been diagnosed and has been undergoing treatment for many years at this point, but is experiencing a lot of side effects and disease related issues at this point. And, um, this is a typical patient we would kind of see in the outpatient palliative care arena. Um, before coming to Yelena Haven Health System, I was at Duke as the medical director for outpatient palliative care and saw many patients in the Duke Cancer Center um, that were actively going through treatment. We weren't at end of life scenario. This was trying to help them live as best as possible. And so that's the goal of palliative care is to help improve quality of life regardless of where they are in their treatment trajectory. So um, how can palliative care help manage her symptoms? So we like to think that we're experts in managing symptoms related to serious illness, in this case, cancer. Um, we uh, kind of are the ones that assess them frequently in our visits. Uh, we have some assessment tools like the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale, which just has eight to 10 different questions about, do you have fatigue? Do you have pain? Are you sleeping? Uh, are you anxious? Are you nervous? Are you depressed? So, so it's a regular thing that we uh, assess for when we have patient encounters. Um, and not uncommon, pain and fatigue are the most common symptoms that we find for patients with cancer. So we deal with it quite frequently. Um, so one is just assessing how severe are the symptoms? Is it just mild and a mild nuisance to her? Or is this something that really is moderate to severe? Um, and so it's just trying to figure out where they're at. And those are through basic questions that we're all taught through our medical training. Um, so, 
when we are taking care of patients, we will frequently see them. It may be every week, depending upon the severity. And if we're titrating medicine, sometimes it's every couple of weeks. Um, but for more stable people, is usually once every month, they would come and visit us. And we would assess, change medications, change treatments, um, and then go from there. So so we certainly could help this patient manage her pain. Um, she has a preference for not using opioid medication. I often say that when we're managing symptoms, it's best to use non-pharmacologic therapies first. So um, that might include psychological support through cognitive behavioral therapy. It might uh, include sort of alternative therapies like acupuncture, meditation, things of that nature. Certainly we could use pharmacological medications that uh, don't use opioids right up front. Sometimes we can use adjuvant medicines such as gabapentin or other um, you know, non-opioid medications. Uh, but when it does get moderate and severe and it's not being controlled with the current regimen, then sometimes quite frequently we have to escalate into the stronger pain medicines and that it's really weighing the benefits and burdens of it. But hopefully our role is to help support the patient through that process so that they are aware, they know what they're getting into, we're there to monitor them closely. Um, nausea is certainly another uh, chemo-related, immune-related disease uh, side effect. Um, and so one other thing I'd like to say is that sometimes we like to um, pull things out of our sleeves, like with fatigue, certainly um, most commonly we recommend exercise. Sometimes we're talking about energy conservation techniques, but sometimes we pull out um, medicines that most others don't think about or don't use, such as methylphenidate. Sometimes uh, for severe cases, we'll use those kind of medications and it's not something that many providers will know, have the expertise on how to use. Um, moving to the second question, how does prognosis factor into the discussion? Uh, is a very good question. Um, as hopefully we follow these people through their journey, we will get a sense of what their likely prognosis is. Certainly there are therapies that we wouldn't recommend if it was a long prognosis of many years. Um, certainly steroids we use for pain management as an adjuvant, but we don't want to put people on steroids for several months to years, um, knowing the side effects of that. Um, there are certain things that we wouldn't recommend if prognosis is short. Uh, things like total parental nutrition for help with nutritional support. Um, if the prognosis is less than three months, the literature would generally not support that. So it definitely plays a factor into what is gonna provide the most benefit and minimize the burdens in those situations. Um, so and we, we get that through following the patient. We also get it through frequent conversations with the oncologists. Uh, the goal is to work side by side with them. And that's how um, my experience has been. And so it's a dialogue back and forth as to how are they doing on their regimen? Are they progressing? Are they improving? Are they changing treatments? What does that mean for the patient? Uh, so it's a close collaboration um, to get a sense of what that prognosis is. Certainly, prognosis can be talked about at length in another venue, um, but it's important for patients uh, to know that sometimes for life planning and other things. Um, moving to the last question, what is the role of primary care and the care team here? Um, as mentioned, I'm trained in geriatric medicine, hospice and palliative medicine, and in those two disciplines, it's very much a team sport. Um, I know that I can't provide the care myself. Uh, it takes you know, our social workers, our therapists, our nurses, our uh, other volunteers, and so primary care is a very important part of that team collaboration. Um, it also depends on the scenario. I, I've seen patients where they just started with a new primary care physician and don't know them very well, don't you know, haven't had many interactions. So there's not a, a lot of trust build up yet, but then certainly there's patients who've been followed by their primary care physician for several years and they completely trust them. So it's good for us to know those things because we can go back to their primary care physicians and try to include them in the care um, and sort of, again, have a dialogue back and forth. A lot of times patients, when they're getting cancer care, just want to know, who do I call when I have a problem? Um, you know, as opposed to just going to the emergency department, they want to have somebody at, at the ready on the phone, and we kind of try to help sort that out with them um, and who's responsible for what. So including primary care is certainly an important part of that. Uh, next slide. So 
I was asked to talk about a few things uh, related to this case and the, the cases presented. One uh, about palliative care triggers. When do you want to get palliative care involved? Um, sometimes it's readily apparent and sometimes not so much. So this is just a list of uh, some criteria. Certainly there's many different lists in the literature about criteria, but quite often we're thinking of people that have life-limiting or life-threatening illnesses, what we call a serious illness. There's primary criteria, secondary criteria, and this was published by Dr. David Weissman and his colleague, uh, Dr. Diane Meyer, uh, several years ago. But we also talk in the palliative care world about the surprise question, and that is, when looking at a patient in any venue, would you be surprised that this patient died within the next 12 months? Um, and it's used for research purposes and just an easy question to gauge whether somebody would potentially benefit from palliative care. Um, palliative care is more focused on needs and not necessarily prognosis, but it's, a, it's an entry question to figuring out the trigger. Um, certainly, if people are coming to the hospital frequently, um, if they've had a severe decline in function, um, unintended decline in weight, uh, secondary criteria include things such as an elderly patient, metastatic or locally advanced cancer, uh, cardiac arrest. So it goes on and on. And so they exist out there. We in the hospital here have a resource card, which we carry around, and it has a number of questions for triggers both in the ED and also in the ICU. So, so we have tools in the system that can help people understand when they might want to get palliative care involved. I was also asked to talk about sort of the palliative care stigma, and I, I leave a quote from my mentor and national leader in palliative care, Dr. Diane Meyer out of Mount Sinai, and she told me early on when I was a fellow that if you're trying to sell death, no one is going to buy. And I think uh, frequently my colleagues and I run into patients, run into staff uh, who, you know, we hear the words, patient is not ready for palliative care. Um, and that is a barrier. If they're not ready for palliative care or don't want palliative care, then we're not allowed to be involved in their care. Um, and so it's trying to uh, highlight the positive things about palliative care. You know, palliative care is there to help improve quality of life. And that's the focus. Um, talking about hospice, talking about stopping treatments, talking about death is certainly very charged and very powerful. And patients don't readily embrace that. Um, and that is often a barrier to getting palliative care involved. So, so this is a what I call a Diane Meyerism that sticks in my head. And it's always to try to highlight the positive things that palliative care does. We certainly do help manage with end-of-life situations, but we don't sort of bill ourselves as that. Uh, next slide. Another part of support for patients, uh, and especially the cancer center, is about advanced care planning. Um, most patients and families don't know exactly what advanced care planning is, um, but really the goal of it in our day-to-day -day conversations is to enhance patient and family education um, about their illness, about likely prognosis, outcomes of alternative care plans. We hear what treatments they're on. We gauge how well they're doing with those treatments. We kind of want to know what other things might be available if it doesn't work. Um, so we take the time to talk to patients and families about all those different things. Certainly, we want to define key priorities in the end-of-life care and develop a care plan that addresses these issues. A lot of those conversations is something that Kristen already brought up, and we use those tools in these conversations and also to help shape future clinical care to the, fit the patient's preferences and values. Uh, you know, do they want to go to the emergency room if they should get sick? Would they want to be transferred to the intensive care unit? Would they want to be resuscitated? These are all conversations that we have every day in the hospital. And if we can move some of these conversations into the non-emergent setting, into the primary care office or to the cancer center visit, you know, it's a, a better conversation in that sense. Um, there are certainly documents in Connecticut that help with these things. Um, most recommended, I would say, is the healthcare representative form. If a patient lacks capacity to make decisions in the hospital, the providers are going to be looking for somebody that can make decisions for that person. And we want the patient to maintain control as much as possible. And so through this document, they can designate who they trust to make medical decisions for them. Um, living will is sort of uh, another document that exists. It's um, uh, not the greatest tool in my sense, um, but certainly helps with 
promoting the conversation. And then the last document is the Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment, which is um, it exists in Connecticut. We do have conversations, but it's not the most common. I'd say the healthcare representative conversation is the most common that we have. Um, the next picture on the slide is just, oh, go back one, is just how for all of our encounters, all of our patients, we always keep them in the center. When we work as a team, we're all working around the patient. And so certainly primary care is part of those, uh, one of those surrounding circles, uh, along with physicians and others. So it's just, again, a team sport, and we just need to communicate with each other. Next slide. Uh, this is the last slide I have. It's just some common things that we are concerned about when we engage with patients and families. We sort of look at you know, suffering as a total total pain scenario. Um, you know, what are they suffering from? Is it physiologic? Is it social? Is it spiritual? Is it emotional? So questions that we have are, are there distressing symptoms? Uh, is there significant social concerns, spiritual concerns affecting their daily life? Um, does the patient family surrogate understand the current illness? Um, there's many a times when I speak to patients who have incurable disease, but they still think that it is curable. And we do have to help with those conversations to help transition the goals at that point. Um, we also ask, what are their goals? Um, what treatment options they prefer? Um, have they completed advanced care planning documents or conversations? Um, and then lastly, what are the key considerations for a safe and sustainable transition from one setting to another? Certainly, we see patients that come back and forth from home to the hospital or hospital to nursing home, nursing home back to the hospital. And so we are familiar with a lot of transitions and we try to help support it as best we can. Uh, and I think that is it. Okay. So this is our last case. It is a 65-year-old female with metastatic lung cancer who presents as a new patient due to a recent move. She is there with her niece, who is her caregiver. She is being managed by a new oncologist and is not responding to the current regimen she is on, causing great distress to her. The patient had to move in with her niece as she lost her house due to mounting medical bills and inability to work. The patient herself has no children. She needs help with toileting, dressing, meals, and ambulates only with a walker for short distances. In your office, she is in a wheelchair. The niece has bags under her eyes and she looks very upset throughout the entire encounter. You ask her what is the matter and she begins to cry. The niece tells you she is under a lot of stress taking care of her aunt and working full time. She feels like she is working two jobs. She is not taking care of her own diabetes and her blood sugars have been in the 300s recently. And this is clearly an argument the pair has had in the past. The patient states she does not want anyone else in the house because she would not trust them. And she's far too young to go to an old folks home. Also, she says she has no money and if her niece does not take care of her, she will be out on the street. So this is a very difficult situation. So how can you take care of the patient and help the niece as well? And how can palliative care help you in this scenario? So I'm gonna turn over to my colleague. Liz, you're on mute. Liz, you're on mute. <laughs> I am so sorry about that. I was trying to make sure you didn't hear my kids screaming in the background, and here we are. Um, so I'm Liz Persich, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. I think what struck me most about that last slide is the comment that the niece felt that she was working two jobs, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge the significant caregiving burden that so many of our patients and their families face. And I know that many of you in the primary care field have seen your own patients be caregivers and seen the significant caregiving burden that many of your patients require for care. And I think one thing just to step back is to define palliative care. And palliative care is really a team-based interdisciplinary means to support patients facing serious illness as well as their caregivers. And 
addressing the caregiver distress and the caregiver needs is an important part of what we do as well. So the niece is working two jobs. Uh, she's a caregiver. Um, and our team offers a true interdisciplinary um, mechanism to support patients and families that are facing serious illness together. And what I wanted to highlight here is really the um, amazing team that we have, uh, both within SMILO and in the palliative care programs throughout the Yale New Haven Hospital, Yale New Haven Health System. Um, and I was going to talk through them one by one. So many times people think, you know, patient is very sick, they need certain resources, let's send a referral to palliative care. And what exactly does that mean? What do you get with a palliative care referral? What do you get with a palliative care consultation? Um, and I, I wanna make sure folks know that consultations are available in the inpatient setting for patients with all diagnoses and in the outpatient setting, our current um, availability is really only for the patient population with cancer. And that is a big limitation, I understand, um, but we're working on that in the background. Today, we're going to talk about resources for our patients with cancer. Um, so when you do place a palliative care consultation or referral, you're getting an entire interdisciplinary team that's working together with expertise for supporting patients facing serious illness. Um, we have a team of physicians, nurse practitioners, social work, chaplains, uh, bereavement care, as well as ancillary services um, within and without our palliative care program, including medical legal support, psycho-oncology, integrative medicine, and also relationships with hospice caregivers. Um, so our social work groups offer individual and group programs, including both bereavement and grief support groups, not just for patients, but also their caregivers. So a mechanism to connect with other caregivers, connect with other people who are facing loss or serious illness, whether you are the patient or whether you are the caregiver is really important. Um, our spiritual care uh, chaplains are available both inpatient and outpatient. They help with um, value-based um, resources, spiritual resources, support for existential concerns, and also help complete some of the advanced care planning that, um, that Morgan had discussed earlier. Um, our palliative care chaplain at Yale is actually one of 20 palliative care certified chaplains in the country, which he's really proud of. Um, so really a dedicated and focused response there. Um, our psycho-oncology team has support for resilience building, emotional support skills, CBT, as well as expressive therapy and art therapy. Um, we contract with an um, art therapist who is uh, part of our services as well. Um, and then we have a very well-structured bereavement group as well for um, both telephone outreach in real time, monthly bereavement seminar support groups, and also support around times of holidays and memorials for patients and families. So this is all clearly kind of some of this is at end of life and post end of life, but um, available for patients and caregivers throughout the disease process. And of course, um, we have our physician and APP colleagues who work with um, primarily symptom management and also navigating these difficult conversations for goals of care, medical decision making, et cetera. Um, so when you reach out for a palliative care consult, you're getting all of these different services. I did want to speak briefly about the medical legal support system. So within Yale, um, we have a relationship with Yale Law School, and they have a pro bono program for medical legal support for patients that are in need, whether that be related to financial constraints, social constraints, or health-related issues. So um, guardianship, wills, financial complex situations that need to be dealt with in a time-sensitive manner, whether that be in the hospital, in the patient's home, et cetera. We've helped navigate guardianship, uh, instant, for instance, for patients that are facing serious illness that have either minor children or dependent um, adult children, um, where time's of the essence. And these are very important things, not just logistically, but also in terms of bringing peace um, and a sense of closure to families, knowing that their loved ones will be cared for and that things that are important to them that they value are, are done. Um, we also work with our integrative medicine colleagues who have um, both inpatient and outpatient services for patients um, that are within the SMILO system. They offer massage therapy, Reiki, uh, aromatherapy as well to patients in and out of the hospital, which is a huge support. Um, and then also we work closely with hospice. So if there's any questions about the hospice referral program, um, resources in the community, we're not a hospice agency, of course. A lot of times people confound hospice and palliative care, but we can certainly help navigate what that system is, inform 
um, educate and also be a bridge if and when hospice is appropriate for patients and families. So, um, you know, I think we have a lot to offer besides symptom management and goals of care and a lot to offer throughout the trajectory of a patient's serious illness. I think that alludes to Kristen's slides, you know, from the time of diagnosis, whether the intent is curative or whether this is a lifelong illness or some an illness with a very short prognosis, palliative care has a lot to offer in terms of improving quality of life, not just for patients, but also for their caregivers. And I think we all recognize the enormous financial, social, psychological, and medical um, challenges that so many people face with serious illness. I think I answered all of the questions that I was hoping to get to. I'm really looking forward to q and I, um, I hope this has been a helpful uh, presentation, and I look forward to discussing more with our audience and other panelists. Thank you so much. That was um really great with a lot of um, very practical pearls uh, in addition to kind of a nice theoretical concept of palliative care. I, I love the specialty versus non-specialty palliative care because I think in primary care, we are doing palliative care all the time. Um, and so it's it's nice to hear that kind of recognize it and realize that uh, some of the same tools you use are things we can apply um, across broader uh, diagnoses. Um, I think uh, just a couple of housekeeping things is there will be a survey at the end and that's how you get the CME. Um, Dr. Chang just uh, posted that. Um, and we do have our upcoming um, talks. Uh, in the meantime, I wanna make sure uh, that we open up for questions. Um, we've had some uh, really, uh, we have good attendance and I'm interested to hear uh, questions that people have. And uh, Ola, I don't know if you have any questions, additional questions on the cases that you presented uh, before we move to those who are watching. Um, I guess my, just my one question um, is actually in terms of the medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, I feel like that is a very useful tool and I'm wondering how we can get that in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, good question, Ola. So uh, the Department of Health actually will send them to you for free. Um, that's uh, how we get it here in Greenwich Hospital. Um, it differs from state to state. It's based upon the what was originally the POLST paradigm out of Oregon, the Physician Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. Uh, my years in North Carolina, the document was what we called Pulsar Pink, very bright pink. Here in Connecticut, it's more of a neon green. So um, it was intended to stand out in a written chart, uh, but we don't have written charts anymore. Um, some of my colleagues, it may not be just the completion of the document, but it serves as sort of a template for conversation. Yeah, and my understanding is that because it has to be green, it's not as easy to scan in. So the patient has to carry around the green form. Um, but uh, certainly having things well documented in the chart and whether we do it from inpatient or outpatient, these advanced care planning has a huge free text section. So I, I hope that you guys look at that when we do that from primary care um, for uh, kind of bi-directional communication. I'll just um, add a, a question as well while we wait for um, uh, some uh, in the audience to come up with some. So Morgan, in the diagram that you gave, which had the kind of circle and then all the care givers around the patient and their family. Sometimes I feel like, you know, um, Smilo has such complete services that in primary care, we're a little bit like in outer space around that. Maybe not outer space, but in a different room. Uh, we're all on the same chart, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, sometimes that communication can be hard. Is it possible to initiate a palliative care consult, get palliative care advice, um, or, uh, or interact? What's the best way um, to kind of interact uh, with you guys? Uh, a very good question. So different avenues. Um, we all have main office numbers if people want to call, um, and uh, hopefully we can provide that to the audience. Um, Epic, certainly there is messaging capability from provider to provider, um, and so that could be another platform. Um, and those are the, the typical ways I communicate. When I see a patient and write a note, I CC their primary care physician so that hopefully they get to see the notes as well and, and are up to speed with what changes may have been done. And then um, let's move. We do have a question that came in. 
Um, and, and the question was, is it possible to introduce palliative care too late? Um, and I think Liz, you had uh, answered that a little in writing if you wanna. Yeah, I, I wanted to answer that. And you know, I, I do inpatient palliative care and a lot of oncology and, and oftentimes like our consults do come too, too late by some traditional metrics. I would argue to say that it's never too late to introduce palliative care, however. Um, I think sometimes we're involved very short periods of time, but have an enormous impact on the patient, on the family, on bereavement um, for the caregivers and for a sense of closure. And sometimes the most helpful support we give, just making sure I'm not muted, <laughs> is when we can help support those with complicated bereavement needs after a patient's death. Let's say, you know, the illness was very brief and there was a very difficult short hospitalization. There's a lot of sense of regret or uncertainty or, you know, lack of closure for the family member, our social workers uh, will contact them and have bereavement support groups, one-on-one -on -one counseling, telephone outreach, in addition to whatever other support services they may have access, either through hospice or other places. And that is a really important resource for many people. So I would argue it's never, ever too late to introduce palliative care, um, ever. Okay. I'm so glad Liz asked that um, or, or answered that. I wanted to, to piggyback on top of that because that was the other thing that I wanted to mention is the, the bereavement support. The other, the other thing, there's actually a study, um, and I'm sorry, I don't know the authors at the moment, but there was a study that looked at patients' families of patients who had died and asked them how they felt about when palliative care was introduced. And most of the researchers thought that it would be too late. Um, and no matter when in the disease trajectory palliative care was introduced, the families thought it was the right time. Um, which, whether that's a psychological confirmation bias or what, it's just interesting to me that almost always families are just grateful for when it's offered. And, and the one thing I will add is going back to that very first case, um, how early can you introduce palliative care? So, so the, my one question was, as, as I was thinking that as this was coming up, um, it, it is possible to introduce it right early on. I wouldn't have referred that patient to palliative care at the time of diagnosis if it wasn't metastatic and she didn't have um, symptoms. But if it was either metastatic or she had symptoms needing to be curled, then yes, absolutely would consider referring to specialty level palliative care and you can introduce it. The way I introduce it, um, and my guess is that my palliative care colleagues, it would be pretty similar because we have sort of a national expectation of how we stand. I, mean, it's, I say it's a, it's a specialty of medicine. It's a focus on symptoms, communication, and sometimes decision-making. The best way to think of it is an extra layer of support. There are other versions of that, whether it's, you know, it's a team of experts who are going to help partner with me to manage your symptoms, et cetera. But it's, it's that whole concept of it's a team. Um, so, so yes, absolutely could have referred it. I think that my thought in that first case is she's just getting the diagnosis. She's completely overwhelmed. So you really just want to ground her in next steps. And, and if she weren't actively symptomatic, I'm not sure I would have referred at that point yet. If I can jump in, just uh, I give talks about what I call fishing further upstream, meaning trying to get involved earlier from the time of diagnosis for palliative care, because um, when you're introduced as just another part of the team, you're not sort of looked at as the boogeyman or boogeywoman. Uh, <laughs> in that sense, you're, you know, I worked with the Brain Tumor Center at Duke, and it was sort of what day should we put the palliative care visit on? Day one or day two, you know, as they were seeing the radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, surgical oncologist, it's just, it was baked in into the care as that extra layer of support. And when you're caring for people earlier on, you develop relationships with them. They develop trust with you. Um, and you get to know the team and, and know their their desires, basically. So it's earlier is better, but at any time we can certainly help. That's terrific. I I, I don't um I don't see more questions coming in, but I I'll, I'll just make one more comment, and and that is that all all of these words matter, and um, I know that, and um you know Ola knows that because we see the families afterwards whether it's because they're also our patients or because we kind of do a, a later follow-up. That's, I, I think, not always, but often part of primary care after a longstanding relationship. And I can't tell you how much words matter. And people will recount entire conversations that happened in those, you know, in the end of cancer care, whether it was a, a turning point um, in management to more palliative care, 
um, to hospice care or the actual death and, you know, words that set them, help them be comfortable with what's happening ring especially true. It helps them to, you know, not feel guilty or uh, not feel bad about how things went. So I think it's, it, it's great. Um, we have one more um, question that came in. Can you repeat information on training for having tough conversations? I think that was one of Kristen's slides. Yeah. I, I, um, are these slides made available for people afterwards as well? Because there are actually links on them to the specifics. It's, yeah, it's a recording um, and okay. not the slides. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe I can send those to you, Karen, um, okay. and maybe we can send them out. But the there there are three sites. So one is um, mm -hmm. capc www .cap, the capc org. Mm -hmm. The next one is vital talk, which is www vital talk is it org or uh, uh, capc capc mm -hmm. org vital talk org, I believe. And then if you Google, because the, the, the link was quite long, the serious illness conversation um, would be the one, the, the other one. Great. All right. So, um, Anne, do you want to? I think, say, Liz, you had one more week. comment. I, I just wanted to, I know this is geared towards the primary care um, population, and I just want to highlight how important, you know, you Karen was saying that words matter and the words that you share and the conversations you have with your patients matter more than any advanced care planning document or healthcare representative. Those are certainly important, but for the patients and their loved ones to know what their wishes are, what they would or would not want is so important. And the earlier you have those conversations, the more honestly and openly you have those conversations, they matter. And I've been involved in the care of many patients and patient who, you know, they want to know what their PCP thinks that, you know, they've seen a million specialists, they've been through the ringer, they've had every test under the sun, and they want to know what Dr. Brown thinks. And so when I'm able to engage with primary care doctors, it's like speaking to an old family friend or a loved one, like getting that history and that collaboration and also the medical expertise is there. And so I really value that work and want to thank everyone who's listening for that. Um, and also think of us, if you're worried about a patient with serious illness and you want the palliative care team to do a check, you know, I'm worried about symptoms. I'm worried about, they've had a lot of financial stressors. Their loved ones are really struggling, you know, ask the team or, or contact us directly. We're happy to see your patients. You know, we're here to advocate along with you. Great. And our team rolls deep. It's not just doctors and nurses. We've got a lot of great resources to help support your patient. Great. There is a question, um, let's see, from the... Will you, from a, an attendee, will you be able to send contact information for scheduling to those that attended night, tonight? I don't know if we can put something into the chat um, or else uh, maybe folks can repeat that. Um, well, for scheduling, so that's for scheduling palliative care consultation, you think? Maybe we need to clarify that question or is it? I think talks. there's a different way to do it inpatient and outpatient, right, folks? I mean, mm. so yeah, that, I, that's how it kind of flows to us. It's an ambulatory referral to palliative care, and it lists the different sites. So New Haven, Bridgeport, Greenwich. That is the easiest for providers through the EPIC system. Yeah. And it depends. The, the organization is based on where their primary oncologist resides quote unquote. So if their primary oncologist is at York Street, then they're at main campus. If they're at North Haven or Greenwich, then that's where their palliative care services would be rendered. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can do it through Epic. I do it once, I, several times a week. Uh, mm -hmm. We're a minute over. Want to thank, I mean, this is such a terrific team. I'm so glad that you guys are here taking care of our patients and helping us. I've learned so much from this um, presentation. Chris and I've used half of those things today <laughs> when I've talked to patients. Uh, Ola, uh, Karen, thank you. Thank you all for your input and thanks for folks for um, showing up and continuing to show up. Please tell your colleagues and of course, feel free to access this online. Have a great night. Thanks everybody. Oh, and stay on for the oh, yeah. questionnaire because that's the CME.